second session by Hugo. And today we will uh, to, uh, today Hugo will give the third lecture. So we start. Thank you very much. So yesterday we we made this. Uh, I mean, we developed this toolbox with all the tools from uh, Rodon Currents. And today we are going to use them to prove uh, our theorem. Um, so this is the subject of today, so proof of triviality. In fact, it's probably going to also be the subject of tomorrow. But And here I want to be really uh, clear that we are going to make a regularity assumption that we are not making in the paper. Okay, this is really just for the sake of presentation. And uh, you are going to see it's already not so simple when you have uh, this whole uh, regularity assumption. And, uh, but it will already give you an idea of what is happening. And before we start to dive into the proof, let's look at the setting of our proof and some preliminary uh, results. So first thing, what is our uh, regularity assumption? So when D is larger or equal to four, it is expected that if X is smaller or equal to the correlation length, then we have the following, C over X to the D minus two is smaller or equal to the spin-spin correlations and smaller than constant over x to the d minus two for every x. And this is our regularity assumption. So we are gonna assume that up to constant, we are uh, comparable to the green function, okay? Okay, so maybe before we uh, start, I would like to reduce the problem to a specific uh, quantity. I would like us to understand that we only need to estimate u4, the four point uh, Ursel function. So first thing, proposition, it's uh, as it, I mean, as I'm gonna state it, it's due to Eisenman, and it says the following. So our goal here is to estimate the endpoint correlation functions. So I'm gonna look at the sum of all pairings of sigma pi one I mean, x pi one. So for every x one up to x two n, x pi one, sigma x pi two, sigma x pi two n minus one, sigma x pi two n. This is first always larger or equal to sigma x one, sigma x two n. So it's kind of an extension of uh, Lebowitz inequality, right? We, we proved that for n equal two yesterday. But what is gonna be interesting is the other bound is that it's also smaller or equal this uh, term to three half of the sum of uh, i smaller than j, smaller than k, smaller than l. So I pick uh, four integers between one and two n is i. And here I'm going to put sigma x1, sigma xi hat, meaning that I remove this term, sigma xl hat, sigma x2n. So by this I mean sigma x1 to sigma x2n, just I remove sigma i, sigma, I mean sigma xi, sigma xj, sigma xl, and sigma xk. And then here, I just put U4 of XI, XJ, XL, I mean XK, XL. Okay, you have always this bound. This, by the way, it's a good exercise to try to prove it. So exercise, prove this using the switching lemma. Okay, so it's yet another application of the switching lemma. I'm not gonna uh, dive into it. 
Now, how do we deduce, remember that our statement was involving uh, the characteristic, I mean, the, the Laplace transform of the random variable T F L beta. Now, when you look at uh, T F L beta of sigma to the power two N, I'm dropping the beta just because I don't uh, want to be having uh, too heavy notations. If I look at that and I subtract 2n factorial over 2 to the n n factorial times t f l beta sigma squared to the power n, notice that this will be zero if t f l beta of sigma was a normal random variable. When I use that and I expand, I just expand this thing in x1, x2, x2n, and I use the previous proposition, I let you think about it. It's a not, not very difficult computation. I mean, it's a straightforward computation. This is going to be smaller than 3 half of 2n to the power 4. This actually accounts for the choice, the choice of i, j, k, and l. Then I'm going to have T F L beta of sigma to the two n minus four, and then I'm going to have two last terms. I'm going to have absolute value of f to the power four. I mean, uh, infinite norm of f to the power four, and I'm going to have a last term that I'm going to call s of uh, beta l and f, and I'm going to tell you what this guy is. This guy here is simply the sum of a x1 to x4 in uh, lambda rl, where rf, sorry, rfl, remember rf was the range of f, right? f is compactly supported, so it cancels outside a certain radius, and you take the smallest radius like that, okay? It's rf. And then here, I just put u4 of x1, x4, divided by sigma L of beta squared. Okay, so here, it may look difficult, but all of this is a straightforward computation. You expand these two terms, you expand this, you expand this, and then you are gonna have terms that involves quantities like that. And you just use the bounds given by the proposition. When you use the bounds given by the proposition, this thing is gonna to correspond to, I mean, let me maybe use different colors. This guy is gonna come, for, is gonna be involving quantities like that. And this guy is gonna be, to the power n, is gonna be involving quantities like that. So when you do the difference, you are gonna end up with terms that can be expressed in terms of this type of things. And when you look at this here, you have kind of correlations between 2n minus four points. And this is gonna be making this thing up here. And then you have terms with u4 and this term with u4, they appear in the S, okay? So here I don't want to be uh, making the computation in front of you because it will be just messy and it will be complicated. But I think at this stage, you can kind of trust me that when you write down what the powers of TFL beta of sigma mean, then you are going to be able to use this proposition to have this bound. Okay? But this is very good because you see, what you can do is multiply this inequality. So multiply by one over two n factorial z to the two n, and then sum over n. So when you do that, uh, maybe, yeah, when you do that, you are gonna end up on the left exactly with the difference between the Laplace transform of your random variable and the Laplace transform of, um, 
uh, normal random variable, I mean, the formula e to the z squared over 2 times the, the, the variance. Okay? So multiply and sum, and the left is going to exactly give us what we want, meaning the Laplace transform and the e to the z squared over 2, blah, blah. On the right now, you almost get the same thing because up to a z to the 4, you get z to the 2n minus 4. You can divide by 2n factorial, but you see that 2n to the power 4 basically cancels the four last terms of this 2n factorial. So on the right, you basically end up with the same sum, but with an index n minus 4 instead of n. So when you resum this thing, you are exactly going to end up again with the, um, with the term with the e to the z square over 2 times uh, TFL uh, sigma square. How do you know is the fact that the force of controls all higher moments? Uh, that's a very good question. If you have uh, the Li Yang property, then it's fairly general. Here, that quantitatively, it does use the random current. Maybe uh, the BFS random walk at this stage is sufficient. This I'm, uh, I'm not sure. I should, uh, should check. I, I cannot uh, remember from the top of my mind. Okay, so when you sum, so again, on the left, you are going to get e to the z t f l sigma uh, beta of sigma minus e to the z squared over 2 times t f l beta squared. So this is good. And you are going to bound it by a sum. And here I want to... Sum when n starts, I mean, when basically with n minus 4 instead of n. So a sum with n minus 4 instead of n. Just what you are going to end up with in order to have that, you have an additional f to the, po f to the power 4, like the norm to the power 4. You have an additional z to the 4 because you had z to the 2n that you need to bring back to z to the 2n minus 4. But once you have done that, this sum with index n minus 4 gives you again exactly e to the z squared over 2. I mean, it gives you again, this gives you again e to the z tfl beta of sigma beta. So where does the little of uh, appear from? Well, it appears from this, this guy, which we need to prove is much smaller than one. Okay, so all of this small computation is to advertise the fact that what we need to prove, and this is going to be really the core of our two next lectures, we need to estimate S of L F beta, which is again, I rewrite it, the sum of uh, X1 up to X4 in lambda RF of L of U4 X1 X4 divided by sigma L of beta squared. Maybe I should remind you at this stage, sigma L of beta squared was a sum over X and Y in lambda L of sigma X, sigma Y. This is without the square. Okay, so we need to estimate this and more precisely, we need to bound this thing from above. Okay? Hendrik, in Eisenman, uh, his state is resolved for phi four and using 10. Okay, yeah, I'm not, uh, phi four definitely, I'm not surprised because this, uh, these things are gonna use, phi four you can use random currents in the same way. So uh, griffith simon type models, exactly, yeah. So griffith simon type models, for sure it works. Question is, I guess, Hendrik maybe had also in mind the n equal two. And there, uh, there it's maybe, uh, uh, one has to be a little bit more careful. I'm not, I'm not entirely certain. Okay. Um, okay, so we want to bound this. And by the way, let's, let's not antagonize. Uh, let's remove the RF, okay? Trust me that RF, you can do the same computation with RF generic. 
and you are going to get this horrible RF to the 12 or something like that, which, which, which happens, uh, which occurs. But let's put RF equal to 1. Let's imagine we look at a function when RF is equal to 1. Okay? Just to simplify our notations. Okay. Um, so that's our goal. So 3.2, in order to do that, you, you see that what we really want to be doing is bounding U4, right? If we bound U4, then very probably when we resum, we are going to end up with a small s of L beta F, okay? So let's, um, by the way, here, maybe let's remove this. If we, we, re, we drop the dependency in RF, we drop the dependency in F. So we want to bound U4. So first thing that we are going to prove is the tree diagram bound. So remember, the starting point of this section is the fact that we have, remember, that u4 is smaller or equal to twice sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, times the probability for x1, x2, x3, x4. So remember, that means two independent currents, the first one having sources x1, x2, the second one having sources x3, x4, of x1 up to x4, all connected. Right? This is actually, sorry, I should not write it like that. This is an equality, so y. So u4 is minus this, or minus u4 is this. Okay? So this is our starting point. So we want to start from this and try maybe to bound the probability of intersection, okay? And we are going to first try to bound it, not crudely, I would not say the tree diagram bound is a crude bound, it's a very efficient bound and it's not, uh, it's not at all a trivial one, it gives a lot of information, but I'm, um, I'm not going to do it, uh, I mean, you are going to see we are going to improve on this bound later on. So let's first prove the following bound. So proposition, I claim, so this is a tree diagram bound. I claim that U4 is bounded by the sum of X in ZD of sigma X1, sigma X, sigma X2, sigma X, well, sigma x3, sigma x, and sigma x4, sigma x. Physicists often like to, uh, I mean, when you want to do expansions and things like that, they like to refer to this as, uh, refer to this as a tree diagram round because you have four points, x1, x2, x3, x4, and uh, I mean, in Feynman expansion, in some sense, it will be corresponding to this diagram. The sum of x, the, 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 the path refer to legs or to, I mean, to spin-spin correlation. So you sum the spin-spin correlation for these four legs. Okay? And I'm just dropping a two that I forgot. Sorry. There is a two. So very clean bound, a bound that involves only spin-spin correlations anymore. Okay? There is no probability of currents or anything. At the end, you are with a bound involving only spin-spin correlation. Okay. In order to get this thing, so maybe first, yeah, no. In order to get this thing, we are going to need a lemma. And maybe it's not the most exciting lemma ever, but you are going to see it's important for the proof. So the lemma is the following. The lemma is saying that U4 divided by sigma x, oh, well, Maybe I should even just write it like that. So the probability x1, x2, x3, x4 of x1 up to x4 all connected. In fact, this is smaller or equal to the probability. And here you are going to start hating me, but I mean, don't worry. It's not going to improve with time. So I'm going to have four currents, which looks horrible, right? I mean, at least to me, first time I saw it, looked terrible. Four currents. I'm going to add two currents, if you want. A second current and a fourth current. And I'm going to ask that the cluster in N1 plus N2 
of X1 intersects the cluster in N3 plus N4 of X3. Why on earth would you like to add two additional currents to this horrible quantity? Why is it better, this new quantity? It's better because notice that on the right, you are looking at the intersection of two independent objects. One is depending on N1 plus N2, and the other one is depending on N3 plus N4. So it's two completely independent objects. So intersection probabilities of two independent objects, it's gonna be easier to handle. So we kind of pay a cost of adding currents, but what we are gonna gain is that we are gonna work with independent currents. So now C of N1 plus N2 of X1 is kind of a, something going from X1 to X2 and having some kind, it's not like a path because it's a union of clusters, but it's like a fattened path. C of N3 plus N4 of X3 is going from X3 to X4. And it's kind of fattened as well. But the advantage is that these objects are independent now. And that is really a big gain. Okay, um, I'm not sure what I should be doing first. I mean, it's always, I mean, do you prefer to suffer first or do you prefer to suffer after? <laughs> like, I mean, uh, the proof of the lemma is not nice. Uh, let, let's get away, let's, uh, you know, like with kids, you, you need to do it to, to remove the bandage very quickly and like that. Day. So let's start with the proof of the lemma. Um, I must say it's maybe the least transparent part of the whole lecture. It's not gonna be long, don't worry, we are not gonna suffer very long, but it's not transparent, but I find it a little bit too bad not to give it because you are gonna see that if I give it to you, then you, you, you have a full proof for d larger or equal to five. So maybe it's, uh, it would be too bad not to give it. So, okay. What we need to prove when we look back at uh, our identity here, or maybe let me even try to use technology. Maybe, uh, okay, tuck. Okay. Well, yeah, okay, way well, better. Okay. So we want to prove that, okay, so proof. So first thing, maybe we can try to renormalize by, uh, okay, so first thing we are gonna do, sorry, is that we are gonna prove this, that you only need to add one current. It's not gonna be useful for us to have this stronger result, but let's prove this stronger result. It's obviously stronger because then if you add an additional current, C of N3 plus N4 is gonna be bigger. So the probability of intersection will be bigger, right? So if I can prove without the third current, I'm a fortiori going to be able to prove it for this. Okay, so I'm going to renormalize. So I'm going to look at partition functions. So there is going to be Z empty set. So I want to prove the following kind of thing. Or, or maybe no, no, sorry, um, because I'm going to confuse you more than anything. So let's start with probability of, uh, yeah. what did I do? I'm not sure, okay. So I'm gonna look at the probability of not being connected, okay? So let's look at the probability x1, x2, x3, x4 of x1, I mean, of the cluster in n1 plus n2 of x1 doesn't intersect the cluster in n1 plus n2 of x3. Right, I can do that if I want. Uh, sorry, this, this makes no sense, we call empty set. So I want to prove that this is kind of larger than, uh, or maybe let's even put N2 here. What is N2, yeah. This is larger than if I put C of N3 here, okay? 
I want to prove that when I put N2, it's larger. And intuitively, the reason is going to be the following. We want to explore the cluster. So this maybe I should be giving you the intuition. So you have X1 and X2, uh, and you have X3 and X4. So here, in the first, in this probability, I want to be conditioning on the cluster in N1 plus N2 of uh, X1. So it's something like that. And I want this guy not to contain X3, right? So in particular, not to contain the cluster in N2 of N3. So I want this not to contain the cluster in N2. Uh, I mean, yeah, maybe that's not uh, the cluster in N2. Let's use orange. Of X3. But imagine that if you already explored the cluster in N1 plus N2 of X1, X2, uh, of X1, somehow you already get some negative information. Why? Because if you explore the cluster, in particular, you know that the boundary of this cluster is made of closed, like of zero current, right? Every edge with one vertex in the cluster and one vertex outside is necessarily having zero current, okay? So in some sense, when I look at the cluster in N2 of X3, I'm looking at a current N2, which is in the complement of the cluster CN1 plus N2 of, uh, of the three. And being in the complement somehow gives you negative information. So this N2 is gonna be kind of smaller in some sense, okay? Now, if I take N3 instead of N2, then it's a completely independent current, and this completely independent current doesn't read at all the, the existence of, of, uh, of this cluster in N1 of N2 uh, that I already discovered, so then it's going to be larger. So let me try. I'm always, always fail to present this proof. So will it be the first time I manage to make it kind of understandable, this is, uh, okay, so let's try. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sum over S and I'm gonna look at the probability, X1, X2, X3, X4, that C of N1 plus N2 of X1 is exactly equal to S, okay? And then the fact that the cluster in N2 of X3 is not intersecting, that is just meaning that here, I'm not taking S that intersect X3, okay? Okay, and when I do that, or well, maybe, maybe even, okay, no, let me, let me uh, even sum over T, it's gonna be simpler, and then I'm gonna even condition on C of N1 plus, I mean, C of N2 of X3 equal T. Let me even do that because just I'm safer. So I'm just distinguishing between the different possible values of S and T, okay? Here, of course, T should not be intersecting S, which, which is automatic by definition, but let's, let's put it like that, okay? Okay, so let's try to write this in a different fashion. So it's still the same sum. You are gonna see once we do this for this guy, for the second guy is gonna be simple. It's a big sum, and here, what do I have? So I divide by z x1, x2, I divide by z x3, x4, which is just the sum of occurrence with sources x1, x2, and sum with currents with sources x3, x4. And at the top, I'm gonna look at something that I'm gonna write z x1, x2, s of c and one plus n2, Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna write what it is and then I'm gonna tell you what that means. I'm gonna write like that. I'm gonna write Z, X3, X4, T of C of N2, X3 equal T. And then I'm gonna write Z of uh, 
zd minus s empty set and z of zd minus s union t empty set. What did I do? I kind of split the sum, the currents in two. There is a part in the cluster and there is a part outside the cluster. And then I'm resumming on any possible, uh, any possible current that is giving me that the cluster is exactly S. And then I'm resumming on all the currents that give you that the cluster in N2 of uh, X3, X4, X4 is exactly T. And then I'm summing on the exterior on all possible currents. So here, this thing here, for instance, when I write Z empty set of A, I'm in sum of uh, currents which are sourceless and on A of W beta of N. And when I write this, I mean sum of a currents, the first current has sources X1, X2, the second current has no sources. They are currents on S, W beta of N1, W beta of N2. And I'm adding indicator that the cluster of N1 percent 2 of X1 is S. Okay? And here I let you guess what, you, what that means. I think with the other notations, you can figure out what this is. Okay? Okay. That looks horrible. I think you will acknowledge this. Let's look at the same thing for X1, X2, X3, X4, empty set of C of N1 percent 2 of X1 intersects, doesn't intersect this guy. If I redo the same, I'm going to end up with, okay, yeah, sorry. Z X1, X2, Z X3, X4, Z empty set. And at the top, I'm going to have this. So I'm still having the sum of a S that doesn't contain X3, the sum of a S intersected with T, which is empty. And then I get exactly, if you think about it, the same term here as before. Uh, of x1 equal s. I get the same term here as before. Now it's for the third current, but I mean, this is fine. But then here I end up with z empty set zd minus s, z empty set zd minus s, z empty set zd minus t. I let you think about it. But when you decompose like that, you end up with this thing. So here, there is a game of comparing. Okay, Ugo, yes. the left-hand side, the sources on the left-hand side might be wrong. Ah, uh, yes, you are entirely right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, empty set and X3, X4. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, very good. You are, you are following, it's, it's excellent. Yes, thank you. Um, so I just split all this sum, it's horrible, but now I notice that I need to compare this guy. No, that was not what I wanted to do. I need to compare this guy to this guy, right? If I can prove that the first one is larger than the, the ratio of the second guys, I'm done. Okay, so just a recap. I need to prove that Z empty set ZD minus S union T is larger or equal to Z empty set ZD minus T, Z empty set ZD minus S divided by Z empty set Z. Okay, I need to prove that. And here is a very cute way of doing it and which kind of makes sense of what I told you before that somehow in this picture here, when the cluster, the, the, the current N2 in the complement of the cluster of uh, X1 in N1 percent 2 is kind of smaller, it should be smaller. I didn't really tell you why. I mean, it's not completely clear, but it's going to come from the following observation here. Here we are going to see that there is some 
positive, I mean, there is some uh, positive information, so positive correlation involved, which is that this is the same as the following. You can write it as Z empty set uh, ZD minus S union T divided by Z empty set ZD minus S. And you want to prove that this is larger than this over this. So notice that in both cases, you are adding T at the top. You are, I mean, you are removing the edges in T at the top. So a way of proving that this is small is to notice that these guys are exactly equal to one over E to the beta HT in ZD minus uh, S and here one over e to the beta ht in zd minus uh, in zd sorry where ht is simply the sum over x neighboring y and x and y r in t of sigma x sigma y so oh, okay it's a terrible uh, notation but i mean yeah, maybe let's call it tilde because it's the opposite of, uh, yeah. So here, it's just a rewriting of the sum above. And uh, now, the last thing you have to believe me of is that I told you that spin-spin correlations are increasing in coupling constants. When you increase beta, you increase the uh, spin-spin correlations. Well, here, what is good is that it's exactly what happens. You see between, to go from ZD minus S, so the, you look at the easing model on ZD minus S, and you want to go to the easing model on ZD. What can you do? So you have S like that, you have edges between guys in S, and these edges, they are in this graph, but they are not in this graph. But you can also think that you started with a model on ZD, where J X Y is one, if x is neighboring y and x or y is not in s and is zero otherwise. So for neighbors in s, you put coupling constant zero. But then by increasing this coupling constant from zero to one, you are going to go from an easing model on zd minus s to an easing model on zd. So spin-spin correlations should increase. That was Griffith's uh, second inequality. But now, when you look at e to the beta h tilde t, you can expand this sum over n equals zero to infinity, sum over x1, x2n in t of sigma x1, sigma x2n, and there are coefficients here, which I'm gonna not even dare to, uh, to, to get. So if you are on zd minus s, you look at these things in ZD minus S. And if you are on ZD, you look at this on ZD. But if these guys are increasing, then this guy is increasing. I went a little bit fast. I realized that by doing it, that probably it was a little bit fast. But just believe me that these quantities are increasing in the graph. If they are increasing in the graph, then this is larger than this, and once you have that, you notice that because this was appearing, I mean, the yellow parts were appearing in both quantities, you get the right inequality. It's a little bit too fast, for sure, but I hope I gave you a glimpse at this argument and notice that this is this ratio of, this game of playing with ratio of partition function that occurs very, very often in BFS random walks, in random currents, it appears really often. And at the end, if you have the Griffiths inequality, which gives you this monotonicity in coupling constants, then you have monotonicity for this, uh, these guys. So this is really an important observation. I wanted still to give you, well, it was too fast, but to give you an idea of this thing. You can re -go, you can go to the paper also, and uh, you can go to the original paper of Eisenman because it's even done there. 
and actually it's done differently there. So don't go to the paper of Eisenman for this. But uh, this ratio of spins of, of partition functions being ordered in the right way, this is really an important thing. Okay, so I gave you a quick idea of this argument, but I gave you all the uh, all the ingredients. I didn't cheat. Okay. Okay. So now let's go to the proof of the tree diagram bond, and then we will make a break. How do we prove the tree diagram bond? So now I told you, you were the kids. I just, you know, pulled off the bandage. Now you are uh, crying probably, but, <laughs> but um, I'm gonna make you feel a little bit better. Okay, so proof of the tree diagram bond. So U4, we said is smaller than twice, I mean, is equal to twice sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4 times the probability. I'm repeating, but okay, I think it's good for everybody. The lemma is telling me, well, this is smaller than the case where I add two currents and I'm looking at the intersection probability of these two independent objects, which are the clusters in N1 plus N2 of X1 and X3. And now here is where we are gonna lose. We are gonna lose because we are gonna say, well, the probability that it doesn't intersect is smaller than the expected number of intersections, right? So let's put this and let's put expectation X1, X2, empty set, X3, X4, empty set of C N1 plus N2 of X1 intersected with C of N3 plus N4 of X3, right? I'm bounding probability that the random variable cardinality of the intersection is strictly positive by the expectation. Okay, but this now is equal to the sum of X in ZD of the probability in X1, X2, empty set, X3, X4, empty set. I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, steps, but I really want it to be clear because even if you just remember just that, I think I, I kind of made a good job. Okay. So this is an equality. I sum over X, the point is at both sides. But now notice this guy is independent of this guy. So this is just probability X1, X2 empty set of X connected to X1 in N1 plus N2 times probability in X3, X4 empty set of X connected to X3 well, here in N1 percent two, I mean, it was N3 percent four before, but now the measure is only having two products. So this is again an equality. Okay, but do you remember what was the expression for that? The expression for that by the switching lemma. So here we use our beloved switching lemma. If you don't love the switching lemma at the end of the week, you are dead to me. That's uh... Okay, so this guy is equal to sigma x1, sigma x, sigma x, sigma x2, divided by sigma x1, sigma x2. It's an equality, okay? This was the third application of the switching lemma. Sigma, when you look at sigma a, sigma b, I mean, sigma A times the uh, correlation of sigma B, it's sigma A sigma B times the probability of the event FB. So it's exactly this thing. And this guy is exactly sigma X3, sigma X, sigma X4, sigma X, uh, I mean, sigma X, sigma X4, but this is the same, of course, over sigma X3, sigma X4. Okay. Here, just for your pleasure, I'm gonna rewrite what I was getting here just that we see that this is canceling with this 
and this is canceling with this. And what we end up is the tree diagram bar. I think this, you agree with me that the lemma was really the hard, I mean, the tough part, but this derivation afterward is really a beautiful piece of mathematics. Okay, so it's a, actually a pretty good time to stop for a break. What are we gonna do after the break? First thing, I'm gonna explain how you get triviality in dimension five and more. So notice that I was still using the regularity assumption. So it's not a full proof of triviality for D larger or equal to five, but I will comment on what you should change to, to do it. And then after that, we are gonna start to see what we need to be doing for D equal four. Okay, so let's make a break. Do you have questions on this first part? Except why did I make you go through this? Which is... <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused still about why we need this new empty current. Because before we introduced them, we kind of had this independence between two currents between the x1, x2, and x3, x4, right? Yes, so it's a very good question. Okay, it's a very good, I like this question. So because I like it, I'm going to answer it honestly. So this thing here, if you would not make what we did, what will change? You will just get probability x1, x2, x3, x4 of x belongs to c and 1 percent 2 of x1 and x belongs to c and 1 percent 2 of x3. Here, how do you estimate this quantity? It's not that clear. It's really not that clear. And that's the problem. Basically here, I don't know how to estimate this because this guy is now not independent of this one. Oh, that was a terrible uh, of this one. I'm not saying it's not possible to do it. Maybe, uh, I mean, we know some other uh, correlation inequalities that probably in this case, maybe you, you, have, a, you have a chance uh, to survive, but I mean, to, to be able to do it. But in any case, deriving this uh, correlation inequalities for currents is more complicated than the lemma I wrote. And uh, the end product will be less convenient. But you see here, this guy, this guy makes, I mean, is not, I mean, you, it's not tractable. Actually, it's not even, I mean, it doesn't make much sense in this case, because if you think about it, it's twice, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think you would be able to manage if you don't get these two different objects. Don't you have here an equality if you replace uh, N1 plus N2 by N1 in the first thing and by N2 in the second thing? Yeah, but then it goes the wrong way around. You mean it will not be an inequality? It, it's an inequality in the wrong direction. You want to be bounding from above the intersection probability. Mm -hmm. So it would be true that if you want to prove, to reprove in 2D or you want to prove in 3D, you want to prove that there is intersection with good probability, then what you are suggesting is a good idea. You can say for X1 to X4 to be all connected, maybe you just want the cluster in N1 of X1 to be intersecting the cluster in N2 of X2. And this has smaller probability. And then if you can prove that these guys do not go, this intersection probability doesn't go to zero, then you are happy and you have a lower bound on the intersection probability. But we are looking for an upper bound. For the upper bound, it goes in the wrong direction. Okay, yeah. Thank but you. I mean, Thank what you. you are saying is not irrelevant because it goes in the wrong direction but actually the reason why the guy should intersect is really because the, the path which is forced by the, by the sources should intersect. So in fact, what you are saying, the probability of intersection of the cluster in N1, or even the backbone in N1 actually, which is something else. 
But okay, the cluster in N1 and the intersection probability with the cluster in N2 should actually be of the same order as the probability uh, of intersection of really uh, that everybody is connected. So in some sense, adding this second current in, in the first, in the first uh, cluster is not really helping. But proving that is a difficult task. It's really a difficult task. And it's true only in dimension four and more. Are there other questions? Thank you. Okay, if not, let's make a break and resume at 12. Okay, so we are now ready to go on the proof of triviality. So proof of triviality in dimension four and more, uh, five and more, sorry. Okay. So how do we do that? So recall that we have the regularity, huh? This is uh, the regularity assumption. So first thing, so and recall also that we are estimating S of uh, L and beta, which is sum for X1 up to X4 in uh, lambda L of, uh, did I define lambda L? I'm not sure. Lambda N is just a box of size L. So it's minus L, L to the D, okay, nothing. Uh, of u4 of x1 x4 divided by sigma l of beta squared. I dropped the dependence in f just not to have this rf everywhere, which was a boring. Uh, okay, so first thing, let's start with sigma l of beta. So remember, this is sum for x and y in lambda l of sigma x sigma y. And then this is therefore of the order of sum of x, y in lambda L of one over x minus y to the d minus two, right? This is our assumption. We are up to, con this, this will denote up to constant just to try to avoid having uh, constants everywhere, okay? So it's up to constant equal to sum of x, y of this, and this again, up to constant, well, choose the first x, roughly they are L to the D choices, the volume of the box, and then you sum over Y, and the sum over Y of one over X minus Y to the D minus two gives you L squared. You can see it because that's a green function, so it's the expected time of the random work spent in your guy, it's L squared, or otherwise you can just sum, and that's not easy. So you get L, to the D plus two, okay? That's sigma L. So we have at least an estimate on this guy. Now let's try to get an estimate on the numerator. So the numerator is a sum for X1, X4 of U4. And notice that this is smaller than twice the sum for X1, X4. Here I'm gonna put in lambda N. And then for X in ZD, and here I insist on the fact that I'm not restricting to lambda L the X. And then I get sigma X, sigma X1, sigma X, sigma X4, right? That's the three diagram bound. That allows me to do that. Okay, so now I need to be a little bit careful on this sum. Why? Because the sum of x, I mean, x may be far away, maybe at distances much bigger than L, or it may be at distances much smaller than L. Okay? So, uh, I mean, uh, distances of order L, sorry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just split between the case where x is in lambda 2L and the case let me drop the two. I mean, this is a, it's a boring two, like that. Where x1, x4 is in lambda L and x is not in lambda 2L, okay? Why? Because 
I mean, we are going to use different estimates. So let's start. So this is, well, okay. Let's start with the first one because at the end it's, a, it's the nicest one. So there, what you can do is you can sum on X. Okay, so you get L and here it's up to constant. You get L to the D choices. This is choices for X. And then once you have fixed X, notice that the sums over the XI are completely independent. So you get sum for X I in lambda L of sigma, uh, let's say Y, let's call it Y, of sigma X sigma Y to the power four. So, I mean, maybe let's, let's, uh, let's write it like that. So it's sum of X in lambda two L. And so this guy here, you get L to the D choices for the first guy. And then the second sum, well, the second sum is exactly the sum over one over X minus one to the D minus two. So you get L squared for each one. So Harpreet, it's, I'm not using the infrared band here. I'm using the regularity assumption. So the regularity assumption is that you are of the right order, right? Here. So I'm not even telling you where it comes from for now, okay? So you have an upper and a lower bound. Is it clear? This is my assumption. It's not, uh, it's not uh, something I prove. So you get L squared to the power four. So L to the eight, okay? Now there is a second term. And the second term, if you think about it, Roughly speaking, you have L to the 4D choices for X1, X4, and then you have one over X to the D minus two to the power four. Roughly speaking. Maybe here you should put, uh, I mean, if you want to be really rigorous, you should put X minus L to the D minus two to the power four, but because X is of, uh, uh, of norm larger than 2L, this is of order of the norm of X, okay? So here you get L to the 4D, and you get this sum over roughly one over X to the 4D minus two for X larger than 2L. So you get L to the eight plus D, and here you also get L to the L plus D. You get the same thing in both. Okay. Okay, but now that tells me that when I look at S of L beta, it's bounded by L to the eight plus D divided by L to the two, oh, sorry about that, to the two D minus uh, D plus two. And this is one over L to the D minus four. Okay. So the dimensional analysis, at least when you are off order of the green function, once you have the tree diagram bound, it's spectacularly simple. Okay? Good. Um, what is, I mean, comments. So first comment, and this is maybe uh, the most important comment, It's not conclusive in 4D because you get big O of one. So it's extremely frustrating because you are not far. I mean, you did a huge, huge uh, mistake, which was to estimate the probability of intersection. You just bound it by the expected number of intersection. A priori, you could lose a lot there. But even though you lose a lot, you end up with big O of one. So, so it's almost there. You want little O of one, you got big O of one. In fact, losing a lot is not quite true. You don't lose a lot in dimension five and more. The typical number of intersections once you intersect is order one. So bounding by the expectation was not a big deal. 
in dimension four, it is a big deal. And this is gonna be what we need to improve on. That's the first thing. Second thing is that As Harpet said, usually you don't have the regularity assumption. You are not exactly of the order of. That's true, but what you always know is infrared bound. So what you know is the upper bound. You always know that sigma zero, sigma x, is smaller or equal to constant over x to the d minus two. This you know. So now let's go back to our computation. What failed if you don't have the lower bound? If you don't have the lower bound, here, I mean, we were really interested in the lower bound here, right? We wanted to lower bound the, numer the denom uh, numerator. Okay, I don't know. We wanted to lower bound the guy in the division. So we, if we don't have the regularity, we don't have this bound. Yet, notice that this quantity basically appears here. So in fact, in general, and it's a good exercise, you can use twice, like you can use two terms of this power four to exactly cancel sigma L. I mean, sorry, you, you can use, uh, what, what should I say? Yeah, you can use two terms, what, what am I saying? Because you, yeah, yeah, you can use two terms, sorry. I mean, I restart. Sometimes you have to acknowledge you didn't start well. Okay, I restart. This type of quantity is appearing exactly there. So here you are gonna get L to the D times the sum for a fixed X of sigma X, sigma Y. I agree that depending on X, I mean, this is a, something that depends on X, okay? That I acknowledge, you see if X is the origin, it's the sum over all the Y in the box of size L. If X is in a corner of your uh, box, then it's a sum of kind of a, a, a quarter, I'm not a quarter, but a, one of a 2D side of, uh, of your, uh, your space, but you can, you can sum up to guys that are at distance 2L. But roughly speaking, believe me, that it's not very difficult to prove that, okay, it depends on X, but they are all of the same order, these quantities. In fact, for people who know a little bit about the Ising model, it comes from what we call the messager miracle sole inequality that gives you monotonicity of the correlation in the right direction. So all these guys they depend on X, but they are of the same order. Okay? And because they are of the same order, it's easy to see that this term here is actually much smaller than sigma L squared. Without having, you don't need the lower bound. You use two of these guys here. You have two guys like that. You use it to cancel two guys here. And then you still have two guys that you prove are small. Okay? So this is probably something I want to leave you as an exercise. prove uh, triviality with only infrared bound, only the upper bound, okay? You do not need the lower bound. It's just analysis, but it's not interesting analysis. It's just, I mean, you can do it, you can perform it, you need to perform it if you are a mathematician because you don't know for sure that it behaves like the green function, but it works nonetheless. The upper bound is sufficient. Okay? I don't want to be entering into too many details here because at the end, it's not really the goal of our, uh, of our class. The goal of our class is to treat dimension four. So 
new section, the improved tree bound. So we cannot go with the tree bound. The tree bound is giving us here big O of one. So we need to improve on the tree bound. And that's gonna be the object of this section and actually the rest of the proof. So improved tree bound. So what does the improved tree bound tell you? So let's, let me define something first, which is called the truncated bubble diagram, or at least we like to call it the truncated bubble diagram. It's the sum for X in the box of size L of sigma zero, sigma X, beta, but be careful, squared. You sum the square of the correlation. So here it's called the truncated bubble diagram. Why do we call it the bubble diagram? Because in diametri diametri diagrammatically, sorry, it corresponds to this bubble. You sum over X, the spin, spin correlation squared. So you have two legs, one for each sigma zero, sigma X. This bubble diagram appears everywhere when you try to do less expansion. And we have people that know much more than I do about less expansion in the audience. So when you try to understand more delicate properties of the system and you use this expansion, this bubble diagram, the infinite volume where you sum over everybody is very important. So notice this is just one thing that can make you, give you an idea that dimension four is borderline, is that B L of beta is a big O of one for D larger than four, and it's of order log L for D equal four, sorry, this is a strict, under regularity assumption. If you assume the decay one over X to the D minus two, then you exactly end up that in dimension five and more, the bubble diagram is uniformly bounded in L and in beta, smaller than beta C. And for dimension four, it blows up. So maybe here, by the way, let, let's, let, me, let me restrict ourselves to, uh, to beta C. Actually, I should have done it from the beginning. It's sufficiently interesting already, okay? Why should I be doing that? Because here, remember that in the regularity assumption here, we did say that X had to be smaller than the correlation length. And that some of the things I told you by summing over everybody blah, blah, becomes a little bit wrong if you, don't, if you are not careful. But for beta equal beta C, the correlation length is infinite. So there is nothing to, to this, this constraint is uh, always satisfied for every X, okay? So let's restrict ourselves to, to beta C. I, I apologize for this uh, yet another approximation. So here from now on, we look at beta equal beta C. And I recommend that you try to see how the triviality proof works in dimension five and more for any beta smaller than beta C. So I was not careful, try to be careful and see what you managed to prove, okay? Okay, so we are at beta C, we defined the bubble diagram and you see already that dimension four is very different than dimension five because the bubble diagram explodes. It goes to infinity with L. So this was the beginning of the idea that we got with Michael to improve the diagram, the tree diagram bound. by making the following quantity appear. So we want that there exists a constant C and uh, capital C between zero and infinity, such that for any X1, X4, again, we are at beta C, okay? Let's restrict that beta C. But in fact, it also, well, actually let's also, uh, for now, I mean, the statement is also true for, for beta smaller than beta C. So let me put it like that. 
And what I claim is that u for beta is smaller than twice the sum over x in Zd of sigma x, sigma x1, sigma x, sigma x4. Up to now, that's the bubble diagram bound. But here, I'm going to add something, which is b l inf psi of beta. So if you think of beta c, it's b l of beta to the power c. And here, for some reason, we need to put a capital C, but I'm not even sure we really need. So what is the improvement? The improvement is that the bubble diagram starts playing a role. Notice that it's not an improvement in dimension five and more. Why? Because there, the bubble diagram is finite. So except changing the two into another constant, it doesn't improve anything. But it becomes very interesting in dimension four. In dimension four, if you have the regularity assumption, then you get that u4 is smaller than two over log L to some constant, maybe with another constant, times the diagram bound. So if you run the previous proof exactly the same way, exactly, exactly, exactly the same way, you, you rerun this proof here with the improved tree bound, well, then you have an additional log L to the C. So same proof gives S of L beta before we were getting here a big O of one. This was big O of one, but now that we have this one over log L to the C, we get a one over log L to the C. Right? So under regularity assumption, this improved tree bound gives you triviality in 4D. I didn't tell you how you get the improved tree bound and that's gonna be the object of the remaining of the class. But if you have the improved tree bound, the same argument works. Now you will tell me, okay, but I mean, you use the regularity assumption. But if you don't have the regularity assumption, so just another observation. If no regularity assumption, you still have the upper bound of the, the tree bound. You, you still have, sorry, the, the, the infrared bound, so you'd still get an upper bound on all these terms here. So really the only case where it will start to be very bad is if the bubble diagram, let's say a beta c, is smaller than a constant log L to a c prime. As long as it's larger, you still gain a log L to a power, maybe a smaller power, but you still gain it. If you are smaller than that, then maybe you don't, you start to get, you see, for instance, if you are like that, it starts to be a little bit problematic if it's little of one, because the boost here is gonna be log L to the little of one. But in this case, it does mean here, let's go up here, it does mean that for many points, sigma zero, sigma x must be smaller than one over x to the d minus two, much smaller. But if this is much smaller, if, if you start to run the same proof, but the sigma zero, sigma x is much smaller than one over x to the d minus two, then in fact, the tree bound itself, when you run the things properly, already give you a logarithmic correction. So you see, you have some kind of dichotomy. Either you are regular, you are of the order of the spin-spin correlation, and then uh, of the green function, sorry. And then the boost really, really comes from the bubble diagram contribution. If the bubble diagram contribution doesn't give you any boost, doesn't, is not big, 
then that means that the spin-spin correlation are not of the order of the spin sp of the green function. They are much smaller. And in this case, by just doing this thing properly, you notice you already get a one over log L here. Okay. So I don't want to be running this because it's again analysis, and uh, somehow anyway we expect to have the regularity assumption. So what I really want to be doing is giving you a proof of the improved tree bond. But I wanted just to tell you that even without the regularity assumption, you get the result. No, the regularity assumption is not known. It's known for very small, if you look at 5-4 lattice models with small coupling constant. So there, the result of Bauer, Schmidt, Bridges, and Slade give you uh, the, the spin-spin uh, correlation uh, up to constant. Okay? Um, yes, just, just to be saying, what, so, uh, and in higher dimension, so it's a very good question. It was actually the, uh, we, we, we had a, a, a discussion with, with Michael that it's known as soon as you can do the less expansion. So it's known in high dimension, very high dimension, or it's known in four dimension, in five dimension, if you look at spread out models. So not nearest neighbor, but you have interaction with a full box of large radius around you. There it's known. It's not known in dimension five for nearest neighbor, at least to the best of my knowledge, it's not known. And it's a very nice question because usually less expansion, I mean, the goal of less expansion, it's not the only goal, but the main goal is to prove that the bubble diagram is finite. This is one difficult thing to get. If you look at, uh, for instance, Bernoulli percolation, where the bubble diagram, or Sefer Wedding Walk, let's say, if you look at Sefer Wedding Walk, proving that the bubble diagram is finite is really part of the game of less expansion. It's really a non trivial thing. Uh, yet, in the case of easing, infrared band gives you that the bubble diagram is finite. It really gives you automatically, you don't have to do anything. It's, it's finite in dimension five. But even getting from that, that the behavior is like the green function, this is not known. At least I asked several experts in less expansion and none of them were able to, uh, to answer me. So it's a, it's a very, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, I mean, if somebody can give a reference, um, there are many uh, references and um, I mean, you can go to the original papers, you have good reviews, maybe by Van der Hofstadt gave a very, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, I mean, extensive review. You, I also recommend as a starter to less expansion, there is this, uh, this uh, paper uh, cleverly uh, uh, called less expansion for dummies. Exactly. Tyler, you are perfectly right. So it's a paper by Bolthaus and Hofstadt and, 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 uh, and uh, Cosma. And uh, this paper has a very, I mean, it's probably the most elementary uh, derivation. And it's also uh, simply not, I mean, it's not using uh, um, Fourier analysis, which is also an advantage of, of this. Uh, this so, so I recommend this as a first reading and the references in it will give you uh, actually good readings to, to, to learn more. So I, I especially like this question of why the bubble diagram being finite would imply spin-spin correlation behaving like green function because heuristically it's what you should be doing. And you see in dimension three, this would have a very nice consequence. Assume bubble diagram is finite, assume. It's not expected to be finite. Assume it's finite. Then if you could prove that, uh, that bubble diagram being finite implies green function behavior, then if you have green function behavior, the bubble diagram is infinite. So it gives you a very nice uh, thing. Yes, you are, you are right, uh, Takashi. Yes, 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 uh, yes, that's very good. Uh, yeah, yes, that's, I mean, renormalization also does basically what less, I mean, 
is even succeeding in places where less expansion doesn't succeed sometimes. That's in as well. So dimension five, it's an open question to actually get the gain function. And it's why I, maybe when people tell you in dimension five, uh, it converges to GFF, it's a little bit lying because for nearest neighbor, we really don't know that the spin-spin correlation behaves at game function. So we don't know more than what we can do in, 2D, in 4D, meaning proving that you are a Gaussian process. Okay, that was a big, uh, I mean, it was a, a, a large detour, but it was nice questions and I think they were deserved uh, an extended answer. So, um, yes, Roland, you are, you are right. This kind of uh, amazing things that, uh, yeah. But I don't think that uh, Sakai's proof of less expansion for easing uh, does uh, the, the 5D thing, maybe a nearest neighbor. I should check, but I, I do think that he requires large dimension. And also the, the, the paper by Bridges and co-authors, I think also requires large dimension. But you, you know this much better than I do, Roland. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree that the bridges and with homes is also uh, more efficient, but I don't know whether it gives nearest neighbor. Uh, maybe Tyler, you have <laughs> a good idea. It's, uh, I mean. So anyway, why, why we, we keep discussing like that? Let me try. Uh, okay, so to go back to our, uh, to our uh, improved tree diagram part. So how, uh, how do we get there? And before that, before telling you about the random current, let me make a, a very a huge simplification. Let's work with random walks. Random walks, simple random walks. Okay, so idea of the proof. Let's consider random walk. Very simple, it doesn't directly do easing, but possibly it gives a root. Okay, very good. Well, that would be very nice. Uh, okay, so random walks. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to estimate the probability of intersections, of intersections, sorry, of two independent random walks, one from X1 to X2, and one from X3 to X4, okay? Simple random walks. Okay, so, and let's say that X1 to X4 are at mutual distances of order L. Okay, let's, uh, L, sorry. Oh, by the way, it's funny because I made the same mistake in my talk on, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday, so it seems to be. Uh, uh, here, you should have asked me what is L in my theorem. So where L is the mean of the xi minus xj, okay? The minimal distance between the points, okay? Sorry about that. Okay. So here to simplify, let's say all the points are at distances of order L of each other. Let's say between uh, L over two and two L. Okay, let's do something like that. Okay, and my goal is to prove that the probability that there is an intersection, so N is the number of intersections, or maybe N is simply X intersected with X prime, where X is the trace of random walk from X1 to X2, and X prime is the trace of random walk from X3 to X4, okay? So I want to be estimating the probability that N is positive, right? That there is an intersection. Is everybody fine with the notation here? I mean, this is gonna be maybe the crux of the, of, uh, of the talk and of the whole lecture. So it would be good if everybody is on board. So N is the number of intersection between the traces of the two walks. So usually what we did is that, I mean, what we did for the, 
for the three diagram bound is bounding by expectation of n. And this is, as we said, big O of L to the four minus D for actually D larger or equal to three. There, there is not even a need to restrict to, the, to four and more. It gives you this, so it blows up in dimension three and mm -hmm. in dimension four, it's order one and in higher dimension, it goes to zero. Hugo, can I ask, what do you mean by a random walk from X1 to X2? So I, I, I mean, so maybe to be, to be certain we have the right thing. So I, I mean the, the law of a, random, uh, of a random walk X is gonna be one over 2D to the length of X divided by uh, the green function between zero and X. I mean, okay, for, I mean, let's say if you look, so maybe I should be denoting it in some way. I mean, so if you look at a random walk from X to Y, I mean one over 2D to the X divided by the green function between X and Y indicator that X, uh, I mean that X zero is equal to X and X X is equal to Y, okay? And I just realized maybe I'm not renormalizing properly, but I mean, up to constant, it's a, it's a renormalization, okay? So I pick paths that go from X to Y. I put a weight one over 2D to the length and I, uh, and I, uh, I divide by the green function. Maybe I would prefer actually that they are not allowed to go through Y, that they really end up at Y the first time they reach Y. So then you need to modify a little bit the definition. I'm not sure what is the best, sincerely, but just think random walk, I mean, roughly speaking, random walk, condition on visiting Y and stop at first time it, it hits Y. This would be another possible definition. Okay. No, not okay. <laughs> I see at your face that uh, I, I don't hear you. You are. Sorry, I, I'm just wondering. So what you're saying is that you punish walks that take a long time with this prefactor one over two to the x. Um, so you don't want yeah, the walk to be. Okay. okay. To Maybe let's let's look at this. I mean, okay. This this will be simple. Probability. Uh, I mean, it's uh, the probability of X knowing that uh, X visits, I mean, X starts at X. And, uh, and, uh, and visits Y and, and ends at its first visit to Y. But okay. it, needs, it needs to visit Y, you condition on that, okay? okay? Uh, okay, yeah, that uh, you see, I should maybe not have, <laughs> have taken this example of random walks. Um, okay, so the expected number of intersections, it's fairly easy to see. I mean, basically this model replaces the spin spin by green function and just think everything is independent. Like, um, so there, the probability that your walk is going through uh, Z is going to be basically green function from X to Z, green function from Z to Y, divided by green function from X to Y. So when you do your sums, I mean, if you want regularity is there for free, and you end up with uh, expectation of N, which is of order L to the four minus D, okay? So that tells you automatically, actually that's the right way to prove that two random walks uh, typically don't intersect in dimension d larger than four. It's how you would prove it. You bound by the expected number of intersection and then it's a very simple computation. But there is a, I mean, it's known that in dimension four, random works do not intersect. So the expected number of intersections is of order one, but the probability of intersecting is uh, tending to zero when L goes to infinity. So why is it so? It is so because when random walks intersect in dimension four, then they are gonna typically intersect a lot. So imagine you have your, uh, your four points, you have your first walk going like that, 
and your second walk going like that, if they intersect, in fact, they are going to typically intersect in many annuli around, around the thing, which is a terrible drawing, as you can see. But here, up, it does like that. So there are going to be many annuli where there is an additional intersection. OK? So let me try to convince you of that for random walks. And then we will do, we will uh, see how we, we, we deduce something. So let's define for every, uh, so there, let's define ni plus one to be ni squared, because I told you that it, it, it intersect in many annuli. I need to tell you what is the ratio between the inner and outer side of, the, of an annulus. So let's define ni plus one to be ni squared. And let's define ai of x to be the annulus, I mean, which is, I mean, to be lambda ni plus one of x minus lambda ni of x, okay? I claim, and this is gonna be the first thing in our, uh, in our thing, I claim that the probability if you start two walks, x and y, uh, x and uh, x prime. So these are two walks starting at x and going to say y and z. So you start this time two walks at the same point, x, and you want them to go one to y and one to z. Then in the annulus a i of x, the probability that these guys intersect in the annulus I claim that this is positive. So uh, here I really want to highlight something. If you start, if you make two random walks run from distant points, they do not intersect typically. Now, if I tell you two of these points, they are the same point, okay? I make you start from the same place and go in two different places. Then I claim that in an annulus of the form n, n squared, then the two walks intersect with positive probability, okay? In fact, here, I mean, you, you could put any annulus of the form n, n to the one plus c, the two walks will have positive probability of intersecting. That's the first observation I want to make. And for people who want to get convinced of that, um, the best thing is to run a second moment argument. And I will do that at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture. Okay, now let me try to give you, this is kind of claim one, heuristic claim one. Claim two is that because what happens in different annuli is roughly independent, we are working with random walks, so you can believe that what happens in different annuli is roughly independent. In fact, what you are gonna get is that the probability that X and X primes intersect in small, I mean, epsilon log, log L. So let's imagine that here the distance is L, roughly L. That it's intersect in epsilon log log L annuli AI of X. Then this in, sorry, in less than epsilon log log L annuli, if we take epsilon small, because in some sense in each, Annulus, we have, uh, do you need Ni? Yes, you would need Ni. Uh, this is indeed for Ni plus one smaller or equal to L over two or something like that. Yes, you're entirely right, yes. So if you pick epsilon small enough, what I'm saying is that in each annulus, you rough, roughly have an independent try of intersecting. So intersecting in a very small density of annuli is gonna have exponentially small probability in the number of annuli. There is log log n annuli between 
zero and, and scale L. So here you should be able to get smaller than one over log L to some small delta. So there exists epsilon and delta small such that you have that. So what does this thing mean? It means that when there is an intersection, typically at least this intersection doesn't want to be isolated in the sense that there is a kind of density of this weird annuli, which are not the adic annuli. They, they, their size blow up, right? Their, their aspect ratio blows up with n. So they are like a density of this annuli where there is an intersection. Now I let you think about it, and I will go back to this tomorrow, but imagine that you have a set, an arbitrary set, let's call it S, where you have this property that none of the vertices in this set is such that around it, the set S intersects less than epsilon log log L annuli around this vertex. So you imagine that every vertex in the set is such that if I count the number of annuli around it, which intersects the set S, I obtain at least epsilon log log L. If I have a set like that, it's easy to see that its cardinality has to be at least something like log L to some power. More precisely, if you have a set where you have only, I mean, when you have a set where for every vertex, you have at least K annuli around it, which intersects the set, it's not too difficult to see that you have at least two to the k elements in your set. It's some kind of contour type uh, lemma that if you are never isolated, then you have necessarily an exponential number of points in the degree of isolation. I will state all of that properly tomorrow. It's just that I'm already a little bit over time. So I just want to give you a glimpse at this. But notice now that we are facing a dichotomy. Either my intersection between x and x prime has cardinality at least log L to the C. Then the, special, uh, then the Markov inequality is telling me, well, the probability of this is bounded by expectation of the size of the set, which is big O of one, divided by log L to the C. So I gain log L to the C here. If it's not the case, then I must have a vertex which is kind of isolated in the sense that there are few circuits around it, a few annuli around it that intersect my set. But if I prove that the probability of this is much smaller than the probability that the point is in my set, which is kind of what claim two is saying, then when I'm doing an expectation argument, but on the number of such points, then the expected number of such points is much smaller than the expected number of points in my uh, in my set, which is big O of one. So again, again, this guy here is giving me the boost in this second case. So I will write this properly tomorrow, don't worry. I would write it properly. I just wanted to give you a preview at the argument. And if you want, you can try to play with it between today and tomorrow. Try to prove that random walks in dimension four do not intersect. You basically have all the tools. Try to prove that. And tomorrow we are gonna see, I will run the argument almost, like, I mean, I will give you more details on the random work thing. And then I will tell you what you need to change to do the intersection of, uh, of uh, the currents. And this is uh, uh, another piece of cake. And by the way, at the end, we will have finished with just the proof under the regularity assumption. And this is maybe the 10 first pages of the paper. I mean, uh, getting rid of the regularity assumption is actually a very technical uh, part of the paper. It's analytically difficult, but I don't think it's conceptually interesting. I mean, as much interesting as the proof under the regularity assumption. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, tomorrow we wrap this up. Do you have questions on uh, on this part? So should we perhaps first unmute everybody and uh, and uh, applaud? So if I allowed all of you. So let's just unmute and clap for Hugo. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, good. So questions. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Uh, we should give the authorization to people to unmute. I thought I had already done that, no? Apparently, Peter is saying that he cannot unmute again. That's oh, okay. So then let's try it again. I think it should be possible now. Okay, perfect. Okay, so Peter, I'm guessing you have a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was just an exercise in uh, <laughs> unmuting and remuting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, if there is no question, I mean, of course, tomorrow you are going to see that, I mean, I'm going to make all of this more uh, rigorous. Uh, don't worry. Uh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Hugo, can yes. I just ask a question? Yeah. And, okay, you, you proved that rather nasty lemma. Actually, the lemma itself is good, but the proof of itself is rather nasty in the sense that yeah, before you had intersections of non-independent uh, current, uh, current yes, or yes, clusters, yes, and then yes. you introduce three and four. Yes. And I think this is very nice, but if, you, if one wants to do this kind of business, uh, one is in some sense afraid of losing something here. Yes. Yeah, right. So you, you lose, uh, yes, well, finish your question and I will bounce on it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay. So do you have some expectations of what kind of thing you are losing in the sense that, I mean, it, log it's gonna, some it, power or log log or something like that? Yes. So, I mean, it, it bounces with uh, maybe your question on, on Tuesday uh, on the, during the seminar. Uh, it's a very good point. In fact, if you think about it, I, I do expect that we are already losing maybe the power uh, uh, just by adding this third current. You okay. see, at least the intersection, it, it seems that the intersection probability for two currents that start next to each other is mm -hmm. playing a role. I don't really know how uh, subtle of a role it's playing but definitely there for this non-intersection probability of currents, if you add, if you do plus N3 in one of the currents, you do change the probability mm -hmm. of intersecting, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. Okay. At okay. least that's Thank what you. I would bet. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I do think that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, now that I think, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say that. Perhaps there's no more questions. Speak now or don't. <laughs> or tomorrow. <laughs> or tomorrow. All right. So let's perhaps thank Hugo once more for this really nice lecture. Um, thank you. And uh, let's see each other tomorrow. So we'll see Hugo tomorrow. And uh, the others, I oh, hope, yes, to yes, resume sorry. at 1 p.m. UK, which is in one hour and seven minutes. So figure it out. Oh,